So first of all, thank you so much for uh, for your time and for agreeing to meet with us uh, and talk about the agenda since you are one of the biggest specialists in the field. Um, what I would like to ask you first of all, and this is also a question that I've been asking myself when I, I first learned about the agenda, uh, what makes it so different from the Millennium Goals? So the goals that were introduced in the year 2000 and there were eight of them. And now we have um, much more ambitious goals, but do they make a, a real impact in real life or are they just another theoretical uh, document? Um, well, the difference between the Millennium Development Goals and uh, the uh, Global Goals for Sustainable Development, which were adopted right at the beginning of my presidency in the United Nations General Assembly in September 2015, is as follows. We have, uh, of course, set out to, if possible, totally eradicate the extreme poverty in the next 15 years. But we have realized that because of the number of people, because of the level of exploitation of the globe mm -hmm. and the uh, uh, impact on the atmosphere, impact on the uh, resources, it is totally unsustainable to try to reach the goal of eradicating extreme poverty along the same road with the same means, the same kind of philosophy that has guided us in the past 15 years before 2015 or for, for, for that in the past 75 years of the United Nations existence or for the past 200, 300 years of industrialization. And why is this so different? Uh, 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 it, of course, it didn't come up suddenly. We, we, we realized from, from very much back in time in the 70s that there were some limits, limitations to the model of growth we have followed. Mm -hmm. But what, what is the genuine fundamental uh, statement of the Sustainable Development Goals is we have to realize that, well, since I was born 74 years ago, we are more than three times as many people in this world as we were back then. And we are, our impact on the atmosphere, on the global uh, living conditions, on the nature is maybe 10 times as high as humanity, as it was back then, when we were only a third of what we are now. And we could say for, uh, uh, for uh, maybe the best illustration of the difference, how, how we argued uh, back 20 years ago and how we argued five years ago. Most of the eradication of extreme poverty in this world happened in China. You cannot understand the, the global situation for good and bad without understanding that in the past 40 years, China brought 800 million people out of extreme poverty and their gross national product is now more than 30 times as big as it was back in 1980. That has been the illustration, uh, without comparison, the illustration for all of us, also for the Chinese, that when billions of people in the poorer parts of the world reach out for the same way of production and consumption, we have, us, the rich billion people in Western Europe and North America. We know now for sure two things. They cannot get it and we cannot keep it. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have more fundamentally to change the way we produce and consume in order to give to the coming generations a sustainable life condition. Mm -hmm. And why 2030? 
Well, 2030, I, I, I think we have to be frank here and say we will not reach all this in 2030, but, 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 but we have to make the uh, very substantial steps forward in order to make our way of producing and way of, of consuming sustainable uh, in within this, maybe, uh, let's say, coming 30 years. Mm -hmm. uh, we cannot maintain the, the, the way of growth we have now. We can have economic growth, but basically on three very far-reaching con uh, conditions. We have good time before 2050 to stop using fossil fuels for producing energy, uh, whatever we find of it out there, in deep sea, in high, high mountains, everywhere. Uh, however much we have, in order to, to, to make forward, uh, forward steps in fighting the climate crisis, we have to stop using it. And we have to develop sustainable energies, sufficiently uh, e efficient and cheap to out-compete oil, gas, and coal. It's, it's a very far-reaching right decision, but it's, it's one of the necessary conditions to, to battle the most urgent of the 17 goals for sustainable development, namely climate action. Mm -hmm. yeah. If we don't do this, we'll not be able to stabilize the climate within two degrees uh, Celsius over the level before industrialization, even better one and a half uh, degree, as we decided in the Paris Climate uh, Agreement in 2015. Mm -hmm. but, but the other thing is that we, uh, if we will make the world sustainable, we have uh, to develop the technologies and the systems so that in good time before 2050, we will be able to reuse all the resources we now throw away. And in very good time before 2050, we, we should finally live up to what we have committed to do more than 25 years ago, namely to plant much more trees than we actually uh, cut down in this world. Some very, very fundamental changes we have to make. And, and, and for me, it's disturbing. Uh, to be frank, that even in, inside the European Union, there are countries like your own, like Poland, yeah. who mm -hmm. will not commit itself to step away from coal. Yeah, it's a big step for us, definitely. And there are conversation because the, the society, uh, I mean, part of society, we can never talk about the, the whole society as such, but part of society is, is really pushing forward the government and demanding more action and more uh, decisions. Um, and, and first of all, to uh, support the, the Green New Deal, that it's really important for us, for, for society, I believe. But you're talking yes. about action, you, you mentioned action and that it is really important to start doing something in that, for example, in the uh, goal 13, uh, the global action, the uh, climate yeah. action, because, um, this is something that is really there and is something very urgent. We have to stop it. Uh, when I read about uh, the Agenda 2030, I heard that part, uh, part of the reasons why the date was 2030 was because, um, because of the IPCC reports and they pointed out that we need to reduce the temperature, uh, I mean, limit the, the rise of temperature by 2030. And this is the urgent action we need. But um, during your presidency of the 70th uh, session of the United Nations uh, General Assembly, um, the theme of this session was uh, the time to act. And um, this was def definitely relevant back then. And so I want to ask what were the actions in the first year and how you wanted to highlight that these actions are really needed? And uh, what's more, is it the actions to really relevant in today's world um, and how youth can engage in this action? Well, a lot of questions, but you, you yeah. must catch up if I've got some of them. <laughs> but but, but, but uh, first of all, what we, what we did 
in the year when I was president of the General Assembly, after having adopted the uh, 17 goals and having adopted the Paris Climate Agreement, was to engage as many people as possible in civil society, in business community, in, in governments uh, uh, all over the world uh, in the understanding of the uh, final, the, the, the basic three uh, uh, demands in, in, in the uh, global agenda. Uh, we, we have to continue with great uh, efficiency our fight against global poverty. Mm -hmm. We have to step up very quickly our efforts for climate action. And we have to realize that we will not be able to get not even popular support for the necessary steps in all this uh, climate action, all the investments we have to do, all the changes in lifestyle we have to insist on, all the changes in, in taxes and so on in order to push, for, to push forward uh, other, be be other behavior in investment and consumption. We will not be able to do that if we don't live up to goal 10 on uh, less inequality. We, we have to understand that the, the very uh, strange and frightening paradox of what happened in the past 15 years, on the past uh, 40 years actually, in this globe is this, we eradicated much of the, the extreme, extreme poverty, but at the same time, we increased inequality. We collected much, much more money, wealth, power, at the hand of the very, very few people and big multinational companies. And, and as everything in the global goals, the demand is global cooperation uh, in order to go up against climate change, poverty, and inequality. And we, and we talk about inequality, we maybe first of all talk about the necessity of, for instance, common European action against the tax havens, the escape from our tax systems from the biggest of companies and the richest of individuals. Because if we don't get a major contribution from that part of, 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 of our societies, we will not be able to realize less inequality and we will not be able to finance the huge investment in a different infrastructure, be it in energy, be it in transportation, be it in uh, city planning, be it in, in, in garbage handling and re reuse of, of, of materials, we will not be able to get this, uh, the money and the public understanding for that support if we don't uh, uh, also, at the same time, integrate it with the fight, not only against poverty, but against inequality. Okay. So that was what we did. And, and, uh, and trying to uh, give life to the summary of the goals in Goal 17, uh, partnerships. Partnerships between countries, partnership inside countries between governments making regulations, making in, uh, 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 pushes for supporting uh, change to technology and, and production, uh, cooperating with local authorities, cooperating with civil organizations, with business life. None of us can do it alone. We have to bring on board all the different partners in society and in the world together to do that and make it more and more obvious that the, the sustainable investment and the sustainable consumption is also good business for people, for countries. That's why we in Denmark, where I live, have decided that we will be in the forefront. We will be uh, uh, spearheading the necessary changes because we believe and tell that to the people who are afraid of leaving coal in Poland, for instance. We are, we are convinced 
that if we go in the forefront, when we spearhead in our demands to our own companies and our own people, uh, the need for, global, for climate action, we will all also give the backing of a change in our business community so that we can deliver the most advanced technologies and products to the rest of the world in this fight for sustainable development. We know we can do it because we did it with the huge windmills who are now being raised at the coast, east coast of Asia and east coast of America. We did it uh, back in time with uh, the whole uh, pharmaceutical and medical industry because we had high demands for the veins to make the transition to a better health system or to a, a better energy supply system. Uh, and that created the, the, the uh, support for companies to go forward, be in the forefront. So it's very much about uh, engaging all the, the partners, but definitely also the, um, the, the business life. And what I saw already back in 2015, 2016, when I was in the UN, was that many of the huge companies in this world actually understand that it is in their self-interest. So go along this. You asked a question about the youth. I think it's, uh, I, I, I have the greatest admiration for, for Greta Thunberg and uh, as a symbol of that generation, actually telling us, the elderly, you have to act for us, the next generation. Because all the catastrophes you can foresee if we don't have climate action now, deserts spreading uh, widely, water in the, the oceans rising and destroying uh, uh, agricultural land, glaciers providing fresh water for uh, one billion people disappearing totally, hundreds of millions of people having to be refugees, for uh, climate refugees. That will create a totally unstable and frightening conflict a loaded world, much more than the one we have already. So it's really for the next generation, it's for my children and my grandchildren, because this will happen within like, the uh, adult years of my grandchildren if we don't act now. So, so mm -hmm. the kind of, 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 of uh, uh, steady uh, attention and action also, civil society action, uh, civil society action like the the uh, the, the one uh, Greta Thunberg is spearheading. All this is very necessary. I can tell you one thing also: if it hadn't been for the civil the global civil society, the sustainable development goals of the United Nations would never have been as ambitious as they are now. It was not the governments that spearheaded. The government did it, and it was a step forward that all the governments at least formally accepted uh, the radicality of this uh, uh, agenda. Yes, that was good, but it only happened because we had a very, very uh, strong civil society around it, and it will never be realized as it was. Uh, uh, yeah, as you said, uh, well, uh, I'm going to say that the society is pushing many, um, many actions in, in different SDGs, and um, I, I definitely, I, I definitely agree with you that um, the Friday for Future movements are showing us that this is this is the future of the future. This is the future, but. Uh, not ours of future generations and that we have to think of them uh, when we act i'm i'm talking also about myself this is my future and future of yeah. my children and that's why um definitely action is needed and um ch children or youth that they should feel empowered to act um but sometimes when we see all um or when we hear about like, the agenda uh, we think we think that it's only a document 
but um, it has real actions. And when you were the president of the General Assembly, you had the chance to witness or oversee some of the actions. Could you tell me more about them? What were the, the what were some examples of actions and maybe the ones that mo most impressed you, that you were most impressed by? Well, uh, it, I was impressed by, by a large number of individual actions from civil society organizations and companies uh, coming forward here and committing themselves to do something in their di daily life uh, to promote this agenda and push, of course, uh, uh, all the, the, the colleagues and uh, uh, other companies and so on to do some of the same. Uh, I, I have been uh, also, uh, if I look at the, the the Danish companies right now, what of course I follow all the most, I see thousands of them actually having taken this agenda into uh, their vision and mission taking it into uh, and trying to define for themselves specific CO2 redu reduction policies, but also taking up uh, very much the, uh, uh, the, uh, the challenge of, of uh, developing new technologies, new products. Uh, we have to realize that this will not happen uh, without a cooperation between governments and business life that we actually, in due time, are, are able to develop that half of the tools to reach climate stability that we don't have, an, that we, 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 we haven't invented yet. We are we're only halfway, I think. Uh, a lot of things are happening. Prices on solar cells and wind energy are coming down very, very quickly. So they'd be more competitive, efficiency is increasing, but we have to do much, much more about uh, this in order to reach sustainable development. And it will only happen with strict priorities from governments and companies in cooperation and a population broadly understanding this necessity. Uh, so my, my admiration goes to all those in civil society, in governments, in 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 in, uh, in business life, that has done something to increase the public understanding. We have seen that in my country. We have seen that 2019 was a, a defining year. This agenda took over and was decisive for the outcome of the government of the elections and for the program of the new government. We, we have set very high ambitions of reducing CO2 emissions by 70% in the next decade uh, in Denmark. So, uh, and I've seen similar developments elsewhere. You can ask the question, what should we do realizing that right now, the most important economy in this world has a president that has stepped for backwards from the Paris Agreement. I think, uh, here, two things allow me to say that frank, uh, quite frankly. Uh, the best hope for this agenda is that they selected a new president in the United States of America in November. But up till now, the stupid denial from Donald Trump of the relevance of this agenda has been contradicted by the mayors of all the major American cities, by the governors of major states as California, and uh, many of the major companies telling the president, well, maybe you don't believe it, Donald, but we are on this because we think we have to do it for the humanity, but also because we can earn money by doing it before the Chinese do. Yeah, that's true. Um, definitely, it's a positive change that will be coming. Uh, I mean, hopefully, will be coming because we need real action. And um, the denial part is true. Also, in Poland, there are many po politicians who are populist in the meaning that they are supporting um, the, the, the 
parts of society uh, who don't want to act because they don't really know what's coming. And this is due to lack of climate education and global education in general. And yeah. we don't yeah. really see ourselves co cooperating with other countries. And I think this is this nationalistic movement that's that's happening all around the world, actually, because it's happening uh, in, in the United States, but as well in Europe. Um, and there will be more disruptions, obviously, because now we have the COVID-19 and this um, will disrupt our societies, our, um, um, our social stability and uh, mostly economic as well. And do you think that um, something that we are all afraid of, the, the aftermaths of the COVID-19 or the situation right now as well, uh, can it affect the Agenda 2030 since many a uh, big important meetings are already being cancelled or postponed, like for example the COP26 in Glasgow. Do you think that it will have um, a big impact on the Agenda 2030 and uh, also connected to that, should we shift our priorities from uh, the agenda and fulfilling the goals and the tasks that are, uh, are planned for, uh, for a long time and shift them to, to different matters? Do you think this is also something that we should be doing right now? That's the fear I could have that the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, takes so much energy and uh, costs so much money that it takes energy out of this discussion. But the worst thing we can actually do is to uh, postpone or reduce efforts to avoid an even um, major, uh, much a bigger catastrophe for future generations from climate change because we are uh, kept busy in, in fighting the coronavirus. The coronavirus will be fought. It can be huge tragedies, but vaccine will be invented. We will we'll move to a new stage where we have to understand that there's also a goal, a tree in the sustainable development goals about health. And this goal we haven't lived up to because we didn't, we were not ready to deal with a global pandemic instead of the fact that experts have told us for a couple of decades things like this will happen now and then and you have to be ready to fight but 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 the, uh, i tend to represent the the positive view on this the there are great economic the big economic costs on, on fighting coronavirus uh, we will we will come down in, in a kind of depression uh, and, and unemployment in, in these coming months. But we also have to understand that we will not come out of it without a big stimulus. Private sector will not uh, uh, come back uh, uh, quickly with the same level of investments and consumption as they had before the coronavirus. And that means that uh, the uh, states will have to drive the economy, will have to have an expansionary finance policy for years in order uh, to, to stabilize employment again, uh, bring some kind of, of growth uh, up again. And that kind of growth should be a green growth, a sustainable growth. And that means that what, what governments have to do in order to, to re-establish uh, employment, should to a very large degree be actions which is also uh, uh, aimed at uh, promoting uh, the green agenda, the sustainable agenda. Uh, we have to, uh, to use the opportunity of uh, Using the, the, the idle people, the, 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 the idle resources after this crisis in order to go even faster on this global agenda for sustainable development. So it, it would be very dangerous to define the true crisis as a choice between the, 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 the middle term, long term, very deep crisis caused by climate change. Uh, we have to act now. There's no change in that necessity because of the corona crisis. But, but that means that, that we have, for a while, from states all over the globe, 
to use more money than we get in uh, because we cannot afford for welfare and uh, uh, employment that both the private sector and the public sector save money at the same time. Then economy will collapse. We will have a financial uh, an economic crisis deeper than even the one we had in uh, starting in 1929. So, so there is a good opportunity to combine the necessity of expansion in finance policies uh, with uh, uh, moving forward on the uh, uh, climate action agenda and the sustainable development. And I really hope that would be the outcome, but of course nobody can be sure. It depends also, as I have already touched upon, which kind of forces are in power in the major countries. Yeah. I think, I think the United States is, of course, very important. China is very important. Europe is very important. Uh, and the rest of them will follow through. But, but, but what we saw back in 2016 was that we only established this ambitious uh, agenda of sustainable development because it was at the very moment where the presidents of the United States and China realized that this was in their self-interest. Back in time, Obama and uh, as at least now Xi Jinping in China. And let's come back to that kind of, of understanding of the coinciding of national necessities and global necessities uh, that were brought forward the uh, the global goals uh, five years ago. Uh, and I think there's a good chance for that. I think China has got it. I mean, they have got it on, on, on the health system and the necessity to act different in the future. But they have also got it on climate because climate change is very, very close on problem in China. Air pollution is a very close on problem in China. It's a national problem as well as an international problem. They have to do it different, uh, and they know that. So I, I'm an optimist, a cautious optimist, a concerned optimist, as you say, uh, but I think it will happen. But Europe is, of course, very important. Also. Europe has a very good reason now to bring its act together on fighting the crisis of the economy, of the health systems, and the uh, climate at the same time. You asked about the postponement of important meetings, uh, the one in Glasgow. I don't think it's that much of a problem that it is postponed because it was anyway a strange idea to have that a few weeks before the American presidential election. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe they will make it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, but what you said, what I think is also really important that you said it before that sustainable, the, the Agenda 2030 um, is really aimed at cooperation. And this, this new crisis that came, um, I saw many pictures of, of how big climate crisis is and uh, how many things it's going to impact. And coronavirus, as big as it is, it's a crisis that will be for, for a while and uh, hopefully uh, will have as, as small crisis as it's possible. But then yeah. uh, the big crisis will come to us if we don't act now. But uh, what you said before is about cooperation. I think this is also also really important to, to just highlight that there will be many countries that will not be able to cope as good uh, and as well as um, Europe, then the North America or China. And they will have problems. Um, and, and can this also impact the, the sustainability of, of the whole world? And Probably it will, but how big can be the impact? Maybe it, it it's obvious that when we talk about the Corona crisis, it will be uh, very uh, uh, disruptive for many of the poorest countries of the first world, and make it even more difficult for them to find the finance and the attention for their investment in sustainable development and climate. So I, I, I really, really hope that we will be able to live up from the rich part of the world to the commitments we have already made in the UN about supporting 
poorer nations in their efforts to get on the top of the crisis, uh, be it the, the health systems now and, and, and the uh, climate crisis in the future. But, but, but we also have to understand that the drivers of climate change is not Africa or poor nations in Asia. It's the highly industrialized countries, including now China. And if we act, uh, that's uh, by far the most important for, 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 for global aid. For, for, for global results on this and will also help the poorer countries uh, to some extent. But we also have to live up to our commitments directly to support their investments in, in, in this if we should be successful all around. Yeah, thank you so much. This is definitely a strong message that uh, our actions matter and um, each, each action matter to be as you said, it's important to cooperate not only international, but also uh, the institutions have to cooperate with businesses and uh, with uh, so society, with uh, social um, organizations. Uh, thank you so much for uh, for uh, spending time, for uh, giving us a little bit of your time. And um, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your experience, because it is really very, very, very valuable. Um, and um and yeah thank you so much and i hope you stay in health and also thank you so much for sharing uh, experiences of denmark as well because this is something that here in poland we can be learning from uh, uh to, to change our policies um yeah so thank you so much thank, thank you very much for the opportunity to meet you on on, on this conversation and uh, i i wish also you all the best for your health and your work for these huge the important international agendas, but yeah. all the best. Thank yeah. you.